All right, well, we're studying in Sunday school the book of the Revelation of Jesus Christ. And so, uh, sure, thank you. I have a little bit of a cough, so appreciate Brother Raymond giving me a cough drop. And so far, we have, uh, we see that John, the revelator, John the Apostle, was in the Spirit on the Lord's day, and the Lord Jesus Christ appeared to him. And uh, I like to say that uh, we ought to be in the Spirit, that is, indwelt by the Spirit, controlled by the Spirit, under the authority of the Spirit, on the Lord's day. And then Jesus Christ might show us things as well. Not like he showed John, but through, uh, through God's Word. He can show us things in there. And we see Jesus Christ glorified. And when John saw the glorified Christ, verse 17 says, I fell at his feet as dead. And that is, uh, if Jesus appears to you, then you are going to be overwhelmed. And we see that throughout the scriptures. And uh, the first thing Jesus says in verse 17 is, fear not, fear not. And so we got to verse number 19 last time. And we see in verse number 19 the outline of the book of the Revelation. It says, uh, write the things which thou hast seen, and the things which shall be, write the things which thou hast seen, and the things which are, and the things which shall be hereafter. So this is the threefold division of the book of Revelation. And that is, write about what has taken place and what you have seen, which he does write about Christ, who washed us from our sins in his own blood and who loved us. Uh, so he's writing about the past, what Jesus has done for us. And then in chapters 2 and 3, John writes about what Jesus is doing for the church today. And then in chapters 4, through the end of the book of the Revelation, he is writing about what Jesus is going to do in the future. So we see the threefold division here. What Jesus has done in the past, he is the one who liveth and was dead. Uh, we see what Jesus is doing in the present for the church, and that is in chapters 2 and 3, and what Jesus is going to do in the future for his church, where he puts down Babylon, which is this world system, and he is triumphant, and he rules and reigns with his saints forever and ever. All right, verse number 20. This is where we pick up today. It says, The mystery of the seven stars which thou sawest in my right hand and the seven golden candlesticks. A mystery. That's something which was once concealed and now is revealed. And so I've been leaving you hanging here. Remember Jesus... Uh, he had a, uh, he had a, uh, the, these uh, seven stars in his right hand, and he was walking in the midst of seven golden lampstands. And we left you hanging, saying, what do these represent? Well, he's going to tell us in verse number 20. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches. And the seven candlesticks which thou sawest are the seven churches. Now the word angel means messenger. And so typically when we think of angel, we think of uh, Gabriel and how Gabriel appeared to Mary and to Joseph. Well, that sort of an angel is a messenger from God to man. And so that's what we usually think of when we think of an angel. But the word angel here, most people believe, is not referring to each church having its own guardian angel, but it's referring to the messenger at that church, the one who delivers the message of God to the church, and that is the pastor, the pastor. And so in the right hand, which I'm, I'm sorry all of you left-handed people, but in the Bible the right hand is called the hand of power, you know, it's, it's where the strength lies. It's in the right hand. In uh, Jesus' hand of strength, who does he hold there? The pastors. the pastors of the churches. 
And that's a wonderful comfort for those of us who, who by God's strength are trying to lead and shepherd Christ's church. So we see the seven stars in Jesus' right hand are the seven pastors of the seven churches. And the lampstands are what? The seven churches. So here he is. You know, the, uh, the, the, the churches that Jesus is about to write to, what he's saying is, I am walking in your midst. I know exactly what you're like and what you're going through. And uh, that should be a comfort to the church, but it also should be a conviction to the church as well. Because Jesus is here. He is witnessing what we're doing, and he sees what we're going through. And that's where Jesus then has a right to tell the churches what to do. Now, what does a lampstand do? What does it do? It shines forth what? Light. Light. And so that is what the churches are called to do. We're called to be salt, and we're called to be light in this world. And so we see here in the lampstand, we see here, and in, 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 in the Bible, the, the, the oil is often a type of the Holy Spirit. And so we, through the power of the Holy Spirit as a church, are to shine forth the light of the gospel of Christ. And who is here with us as we shine forth that light? Jesus. That's right, the glorified Christ. And the pastors are held in his right hand. What a beautiful picture of comfort as we come to chapter 2. Chapter number 2. Any thoughts about that? Any questions? All right, chapter number 2 of Revelation. The first letter goes to the church of Ephesus. Unto the angel, now who do we believe that is? Pastor. That's right, Pastor. I don't think that Jesus would be writing to a heavenly angel, okay, a heavenly being. And so I believe Jesus is writing to the messenger of the church. He's writing to the pastor, the pastor. Unto the angel of the church of Ephesus write, These things saith he that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand, who walketh in the midst of of the seven golden candlesticks. So here he is. To the pastor. I'm holding you in my hand. To the church. I'm there in your midst. Now each of these letters have three components. And sometimes not all three of these components are utilized. But number one, there is a commendation. In other words, Jesus tells most of these churches something they're doing right. He commends them. Number two, there's a criticism. Jesus tells these churches something they're doing wrong. And number three, there is a conclusion. Okay, you know, because you're doing this right, because you're doing this wrong, here is the result of the matter. Here is what I am going to do, what I'm about to do there in your church. And so for the church of Ephesus, I think, you know, we are a fundamental, independent Baptist church. And I think of all of these seven churches, that this church at Ephesus probably most accurately represents most of the churches in our movement. And I think you'll see why as we look at the commendation and the criticism of Christ to this church. Look at the commendation, verse 2. I know. Now you'll see this over and over again. I know. You know, Jesus is omniscient, all-knowing God. So he knows. I know thy works and thy labor and thy patience, how thou canst not bear them which are evil, and thou hast tried them which say they are apostles and are not, and hast found them liars. Verse 3. And as born and has patience, and for my name's sake has labored, and has not fainted. Verse 6. But this thou hast, that thou hatest 
the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. So who can tell me a positive thing about the church at Ephesus? What's something they're doing right? Patience. They have patience. That's right. Patience is, is long-suffering, and uh, typically patience deals with uh, being faithful in the midst of trials. Yeah, they're patient. They're faithful. Something else about this church. Anything? What's that? They're laboring. That's right. That's one of the things I put here. And that is they're aggressive in their service for God. You know, if they'd have had a, a WANA program or a King's Kids program, if there had been buses back then, they might have had a bus ministry. It's soul winning. They were going out and, and sharing the gospel with people. They labor. They were working hard in the name of Christ. And they were doing it with patience, not, uh, not caring about any opposition that might be out there for what they're doing. That's right. What else are they doing here? There's something here very particular. They've not fainted. Well, they haven't fainted. That's right. That's part of the, what I've been just talking about. They've tried the false apostles. Ooh, that's right. They've tried the false apostles. They're not only aggressive in service, but they're fighting. They're aggressive and fighting false teachers. You know, you come in, and you have a wrong doctrine. You don't teach what the Bible says. They're quick to point it out. It says here, Thou hatest the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. And after studying that term, Nicolaitans, there are a lot of speculations as to what that is, but... It's some sort of a false teaching that was prevalent in that day. We don't exactly know. So here they are. They're doctrinally strong. You know, it says here, uh, you know, that they, uh, anyway, they're, they're, they're pointing out these false teachings. They're doctrinally strong. They're aggressive in their service for the Lord. And they're aggressive in fighting false teachers. But verse number four we see the criticism of the church by the one who walks in their midst, by the one who holds the pastor in his hand. Verse 4, Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee, because thou hast left thy first love. <clears throat> Nevertheless, in spite of all that good stuff, they have a friend Sunday. They have old-fashioned Sunday. They have revival services. All this stuff going on like a three-ring circus for the Lord. <laughs> and they're fighting against false teaching. And they're standing up for what's right. It says, nevertheless, in spite of all that good, thou hast left thy first love. Jesus gives two commandments in the Gospels. that says, summarizes all ten of the commandments. What are they? Love God and love your neighbor. Love the one who is near you. So first love. You have left your first love. Love for Christ, first of all. A love for others, fellow Christians and unbelievers. The question we have to ask ourselves as we teach correct doctrine, as we fight for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints, as we expose false teachers, as we do our ministry here in the church, the question we have to ask ourselves is why do we do what we do? Because if we're not doing it because we love God, and we love other people, we're going to get burned out. And so here's the conclusion. Verse number five. Remember, therefore, from whence thou art fallen, and repent, and do the first works, or else I will come unto thee quickly, 
and will remove thy candlestick out of his place, except thou repent. So Jesus is saying here, unless you get back to the first works, unless you get back to the right motivation for ministry, which is loving God and loving others, then I am going to remove your candlestick, remove your lampstand. <coughs> and what does the candlestick, the lampstand represent? The church. the church. If you don't do things for the right reason, then I am going to just remove you. I am going to close you down. And I think that's what we see, especially in our particular movement, Independent Fundamental Baptist. We see churches dwindling. We see churches shutting down because we're just not doing the right things for the right reasons. All right, verse number seven. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. And we're going to talk more about that tree of life as we get over to the end of the book of the Revelation. But what does it mean to overcome? I like to get this straight. 1 John chapter 5. How do we overcome? I'm sure there have been a lot of preachers who've preached a message on overcoming, and they've made it seem like that song, uh, you know, about the weary pilgrim, you know, and just uh, in tattered garments clad, struggling up the mountain. It seemed that he was sad, but yet in spite of all the burdens, he overcame. <laughs> well, that's not what this is talking about here when it talks about one who overcomes. First John, which was penned by the same author's revelation, John the Apostle, verses 4 and 5 of chapter 5, <coughs> it says, For whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world, and this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. Who is he that overcometh the world? There's a question, right? But he that believeth that Jesus is the Son of God. Those who overcome the world, the overcomers, are those who are born again, those who are born of God, and those who have true belief in Jesus, the Son of God. They truly believe in Jesus, the Son of God, they're truly trusting Him, and they've been born again. And they have the Holy Spirit living within them. They've been radically changed. That's what it means to be an overcomer. Being born again through faith in Jesus, the Son of God. And if you do that, then no matter what you're going through today, whatever struggles you are going through, one day you're going to be able to enjoy the new heavens and the new earth and you'll be able to eat of the tree of life in the midst of the paradise of God. And they will be talking more about that as we come to the end of the book of the Revelation. Any questions or comments about the church at Ephesus? A really convicting passage for me and the movement of churches I find myself in. All right, let's move on. Smyrna, Smyrna, the church in Smyrna. Uh, verse number 8, And unto the angel, which is likely who? Pastor. Pastor. Of the church in Smyrna, right? These things said the first and the last, which was dead and is alive. <laughs> we see that's a, almost a direct quote from verses 17 and 18 of chapter 1. Jesus says, I am the first and the last. <coughs> I am he that liveth and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore, amen, and have the keys of hell and of death. So here he is, the Lord Jesus Christ, first, last, the one who was dead and now is alive. Now the fact that Jesus was dead and now is alive, I think has a particular significance for the church in Smyrna. And let's see what that particular significance might be. All right, here is the commendation. Verse number 9. I know thy works, 
and tribulation and poverty, but thou art rich. And I know the blasphemy of them which say they are Jews and are not, but are of the synagogue of Satan. The church at Smyrna is ministering in spite of great trials. They're ministering in spite of great trials. I know, I know, Jesus knows exactly what we're going through, and he is right there with us, walking in the midst of the candlesticks, walking in the midst of his churches. He knows what you and I are going through today if we're God's child. He knows, and he cares, and he sees whether or not we're being faithful in the midst of what we're going through. Now it says here in verse number 9, I know thy works and tribulation. The word works means I know your faithfulness to do what I've called you to do, carrying out the Great Commission. I know your tribulation. I know the trials that you're going through. And I know you're struggling financially. I see your poverty. But then it says here in parentheses, but thou art rich. Is that a contradiction in the Bible? <laughs> How can you be poor and be rich? You're spiritually rich. Ah, yes, that's right. Even though they're physically lacking a lot of the things this world has to offer, they are spiritually rich. Let's look at some passages that show this to us. James. Chapter 2, verse 5. <coughs> James 2, 5. James 2, 5. It says, Hearken, my beloved brethren, hath not God chosen the poor of this world, rich in faith, and heirs of the kingdom which he hath promised to them that love him? God has chosen people who are the poor of this world. Those who don't have as much as others in this world. And a lot of times, there are compromises that people in this world have to make in order to be wealthy in this world. You know, for myself, if I'm not working in an emergency services field, which is like a doctor, a fireman, a policeman, or something like that, then I'm not going to work on the Lord's Day. I'm going to find a job where I can have off on the Lord's Day, that first day of the week. Say, so, well, that might cost you a promotion. You may not get exactly the job that, that pays better. I don't care. Because my focus is not on making money. My focus is on pleasing God. And so you may be poorer in this world, but all that matters is whether or not you're rich in faith and whether or not you're an heir of the kingdom which he has promised to those who love him. Living for the next world and not this world. We see 2 Corinthians 6, verse 10. I want you to get this concept. Describing the church, describing himself, Paul says, as sorrowful, yet always rejoicing, as poor, yet making many rich, as having nothing, and yet possessing all things. Poor, yet making many rich. What does that mean? Giving out the gospel. That's right. That's all that matters. It's all that matters is where you're going to spend eternity. And whether or not you have a relationship with God. That's the most wealthy thing you can have. It's the only thing that's of any value. And he's giving that out. And then he says, having nothing, yet possessing all things. What does that mean? 
Well, yeah, he, he, he may have very little earthly goods, but yet he, he has heaven in store. And he'll enjoy the new heavens and the new earth wherein reigneth righteousness. And, and when, when all those who continue in their rebellion against God are cast into the lake of fire, when Babylon has fallen, here he is with the meek inheriting the earth. Something to think about, isn't it? Who's, who's really rich? 2 Corinthians 8, 2. How that in a great trial of affliction, the abundance of their joy and their deep poverty abounded unto the riches of their liberality. In spite of being poor, the churches of Macedonia were very generous, and they were rich with joy. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 34. Hebrews 10, 34. <coughs> For ye had compassion of me in my bonds, and took joyfully the spoiling of your goods, knowing in yourselves that ye have in heaven a better and enduring substance. Here, the writer of Hebrews, who I believe is Paul, was in bonds. He was in prison, in jail. And the people that he's writing to here, they had compassion on him. And they took of their own goods, which probably weren't many, their own possessions, which probably weren't many, and they gave them to the Apostle Paul. How could they do that? Because they know that they have in heaven a better and enduring substance. In other words, by giving to Paul a man in need, they were investing in eternity which is the only place that matters because it's the only place that lasts forever. And one other place, Matthew chapter 6. Matthew 6, 19 through 21. You want to be truly rich? Jesus says, beginning of verse 19 of Matthew 6, Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth, where moth and rust doth corrupt, where thieves break through and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt, where thieves do not break through nor steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. You know, some years ago, our family had a worker in our house, and all of a sudden a tub of Lego men went missing. That was kind of a traumatic event for the kids because they had collected those Lego men. But it taught a good lesson, did it not? That is nothing on this earth lasts forever. And nothing on this earth is guaranteed. Therefore, if you want a sure investment, invest in eternity. Invest in eternity and not in this life. Because everything that we have in this life is perishable. And with that stock market going up and down, a lot of people have been watching their retirement accounts and they're realizing how perishable and how fleeting it is. So verse number 33 of Matthew 6, Jesus says, But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all of these things shall be added unto you. You put my kingdom first, Jesus says. You put me first. You seek to please me, to live righteously. And guess what? I'll take care of my own. I'll take care of my own. So we've gotten halfway through the church at Smyrna. And what we'll do is uh, we will look at this last part of verse number 9 next time where it says, I know the blasphemy of them which say they are Jews and are not, but are the synagogue of Satan.
Who are these people who worship at the synagogue of Satan, who are opposing the church in Smyrna? Well, we will pick up there, Lord willing, next time.